How's it going guys? My name is Kevin. I'm a DP out of the LA Orange County area and today we are in part four. This is the last part of our four part series. It was originally a five part series but I kind of combined a couple of the parts. If you haven't already seen them, go back and watch the, the previous parts. I basically cover a commercial production that I was on for an entire week and I break down pre-production. I break down um, all the locations we were at, how I lit them, how we shot them, how I held the cameras, basically everything. And today is part four where we just kind of go over what I learned, um, some of the takeaways. We just kind of debrief and talk about, I don't know, some of the some of the important takeaways from the entire production as a whole. Let's jump in. Starting with the importance of pre-production. Now this is nothing new, and if you watched part one of this series, you saw that we did go through an entire pre-production process. Um, and I just can't stress enough the reminder of pre-production and why it's just so, so, so crucial and critical to the success of any job, whether it's in film, creative, wh wherever you are, planning and prepping is so massive and so important. Now in part one, I did mention we didn't go on a location scout, but I was corrected later. Grant and the guys actually did go on a location scout, um, but I was brought on, I believe, later on in the process after they had already started pre-pro, and so I wasn't able to go on those location scouts. You know, we didn't have it in our control. It wasn't in my control to to go on that because I was brought I was brought on later. I was able to see pictures and everything, um, but if it was a perfect world and we had all the time in the world to do pre-production. I would have went on those location scouts and I would have seen each room and each scene and each setup that we were going to do. And I would have been able to mitigate some of the wasted time that we spent just setting up and trying to problem solve for these locations and these um, spots that we were shooting in. It's no one's fault. I was just, you know, brought on later. So I wasn't able to go. The, the most I saw was location scouts, but I know for a fact every single job I'm going to push for pre-production hours. If a client comes to me and says, hey, we have this massive grand idea that we want to be able to accomplish, I'm definitely going to try to invest a lot of time and try to push them to say, let's get some pre-production hours. Let's do, whether you want to do it for free or not, I'm trying to push more of like, hey, I'll, I'll cut my day rate in half for just one pre-production day, if anything, where I can go look at the, I can go look at the location, the studio, um, just wherever I'm going to be shooting, just to be able to come up with a plan, see where the sun's hitting, see, see where the light's coming in, have a plan and have an advantage of all the different obstacles that you would be hitting and you'd have already have a plan for it before you actually showed up for that production day. So location scouting and really just pre-production, everything, as, as much as you can plan before the production day is just so important. And of course, there's going to be those times where you run into an issue that, you know, you can plan so much and you're still going to run into issues. Um, but it's just so important to kind of know the, the path that you're about to go on and know where the roadblocks are and know where those obstacles are so that you can come up with a day of plan and be able to kind of have audibles. If this were to happen, then I would do this. And if that were to happen and that didn't work out, well, I have plan B and C and D. And so, yeah, pre-production is, is, is massive. Narrow down your targets, come up with a plan of execution and how you're going to hit those targets. Pre-production is the production. It is where the production happens. So the next big takeaway for me was just getting a lot of time behind the Alexa mini camera system. I've definitely shot with it before, but being able to spend an entire week and hours and hours of just opping it just made me feel more comfortable with it, uh, made me feel more comfortable shooting on it. And I feel like in the future, if I ever need to rent one, I'm not as intimidated as I used to be because you hear these big cool stories about this is a Hollywood camera, this is what most of the Hollywood films are shot on. And you kind of start to get you know, intimidated by it. And it kind of just demystified it. Being able to shoot for it for five days straight, it just demystified the idea that this was something that was unattainable um, and that I didn't, I wasn't at that level yet. And it kind of just took away that fear for me. And I just feel like I have a really good feel of the camera. And the funny thing is it's such a high end expensive camera, but it's so much simpler than anything you would imagine. If you haven't shot an Alexa Mini before, you, I mean, if you're if you're anything like me, I was just again, I was a little intimidated by it, and I was just like, you know, I I don't know how to operate that thing. That's like that's high end. 
But I think the reason it costs so much and the reason so many big productions and Hollywood films use it is because it's just so simple and straightforward. It's made for the camera operator. It's made for a crew, yes. It's not necessarily the easiest camera to use by yourself, but it is such an easy camera to use. There's no guessing. It's all very intuitive, simple, and obviously makes incredibly beautiful images. One of the biggest takeaways from this production for me, and this is going to be a little bit vulnerable because it's not only in my professional life, but it's also just in life in general. And that's just the idea of being presented with, um, you know, someone gives you a big opportunity and presents you with this big idea that they want you to be a part of and, and kind of take on. Um, I'm the kind of person that will try, that, that will hear that and immediately my mind will start racing and I will start stressing out. I'll start adding up all this pressure on myself to be able to figure all of it out on my own and how we're gonna be able to get past all the obstacles and all the, well, you wanna accomplish this? We're gonna to have to get that crew. We're gonna to have to rent that camera. How are we gonna light this? You, you wanna do it? You wanna do this type of job in this location? And you, how are we gonna, it's just, there's so many different things that start flooding my mind the minute I get presented with an opportunity and I end up putting all this pressure on myself to be able to deliver on all of those little questions and all those little factors and obstacles I start throwing in and that's the second I hear it. This production was the same way where you know the guy the guys reached out to me and said hey we've got this cool production that we want you to be a part of and we want you to we want you to DP and direct it and immediately I just started adding all these different obstacles that I knew we would have to, you know, figure out, but I was trying to figure it all out right there. And that just equaled a bunch of pressure. And I was honestly at a low point, um, just kind of going through the pre-production and just kind of going through it all because I was stressing myself out for no reason. I, I, I wasn't taking my time with it and I was trying to figure out all the obstacles and just letting my mind race about all these different things. I couldn't sleep at night. Um, and this stuff's just stresses me out because I'm I'm trying to iron out all these details straight away. And I just think my brain couldn't handle it. All the moving parts and all the details. And, and then you add in the pressure of the clients and the agency looking to you as a DP or director to come up with all the answers. All, all trying to figure all that out in one sitting is not normal. You're not, you're not in, you're not supposed to be able to figure all that out unless you're a Superman, but I can't do that. And it was important for me to realize that. But that said, I'm like so glad that I went through it because it really taught me that I need to take it in stride, right? Like I need to know that there is a crew of talented people around me and this is why there is pre-pro and this is, and, and all these steps that you're supposed to take. And I'm guilty for trying to figure out how I'm supposed to jump to the top of the staircase of understanding it. And I easily forget about the stairs, each and every stair that gets you to the top that's right in front of me. I need to be able to look down and say like, look, we'll get there, but you know, just don't worry about what's ahead, worry about what's right in front of you. And it's like a mentality thing, right? Like the way I need to train my way and, and change the way my brain immediately reacts to a big concept in life. If ever I get a big opportunity, I just have to take a deep breath, chill, back up a little bit, and just take it one step at a time. Take it one day at a time. Take it one hour at a time if I, if I really have to. I also have to be present in each one of those steps. If I'm taking it one step at a time, I need to not stress about the couple steps ahead. I need to figure out and be present and engaged and thoroughly investigate and thoroughly flesh out the step that I'm at whichever process of the production I'm at, I need to be in that and not stress, not let my mind wander off. And, and even though I'm kind of worried about, you know, this obstacle ahead, like how are we going to light, you know, that scene? I already saw it. That's in the back. I need to block that stuff out. We're not talking about that right now. We're talking about this. Let's worry about this and we'll get there. The last thing I would have done differently is, is I wouldn't have used set a light for storyboarding. Uh, which is a nice segue into some Q&A from the previous parts of the series. So let's jump in. In part one, Eric Smith asked, what storyboarding program did you use? My drawings are horrendous and your storyboards look sick. 
For storyboarding, I used a program called Set a Light. It's a 3D lighting program that's primarily made for studio photographers. It's very similar to Cine Tracer, although they have been updating their elements and their different lighting with a bunch of video stuff. Um, so they have like S60s, S30s, they have a bunch of video lighting things for studios. So it's very helpful to practice, but um, I shouldn't have used it for Set a Light. And here's why. First of all, you have to make the whole scene. You have to build the whole scene. Um, and it looks great and the lighting is very accurate the way it falls off and everything is great and it looks great and it's very precise um, but that was the bad part storyboards aren't meant to be this specific you want to leave them more general and vague um, because at this part of the process in pre-production uh, you haven't really figured out all those details and some some details might want to change and so you kind of lock yourself into uh, an original concept that leaves no room for evolution and it leaves no room for any sort of adjustments because you've kind of almost limited and restricted yourself to what the specific storyboard was designed as. And so that's why you see scribbles and that's why you see stick figures. It should probably be like that and allow room for um, changes and evolution and, and audibles down the, down the line because um, you'll find yourself locked into too much to one specific idea. And storyboards are really meant to just give you the idea of what's happening, where is the story going, what's the general flow of this, um, this video or this film or this commercial. Um, so it's amazing for practicing lighting, um, especially in studio, um, but it's not good for storyboards. I, I had to do a couple revisions of the storyboard because the client came back and said, well, why is she here and why is her hair like that? Well, that's not really what we think or why was it, you know, I even made it colored and I shouldn't have done it in color. I should have done it black and white. And so that took up a lot of time because I had to go back and recreate a lot of the frames in the storyboard and I, I had already set their expectations high with the beautiful designed um, layout. And so that's kind of what they expected from there on out. I couldn't then go back and give them stick figures because then they'd be like, what the heck, you know? So I think next time I definitely, if I have to do storyboards, I'll probably do stick figures and make, they'll probably look horrendous. Um, but that's, that's by design. Mon Charles asks, what tripod head are you using? It looks like Benro. So we did use a Benro tripod head. It was B something 10. One of my friends had that tripod and it was supporting the Alexa rigged up, no problem. I did eventually upgrade to the Sockler Active 10 head with 100 millimeter um, ball mount. That's coming in in this next month or two. So I'm stoked to be using that one. I love Sockler Flowtech, the legs, and I'm excited for this new Active 10 uh, head, which will allow me to just quickly maneuver the balance of it and quickly maneuver the horizon levels and switch it from slider to, yeah. Anyway, this isn't about gear. In part two, Cannabis Culture asks, where can we see the final output of the commercial? Um, I plan on posting it here on YouTube pretty soon. Um, it's already on my Vimeo page, so if you go to my Instagram, or I'll, I'll, I'll tag it down below in the description. Victor Wynn asks, do you own your own haze machine? If yes, do you have a recommendation? Um, I do own my own haze machine. It isn't anything special. It's not like the professional ones. It's kind of cheap. It's by Chevet, and it's called the Hurricane Hazer 2D. And it's, it's, it's a decent size and it gets the job done and it has a couple different settings. So I use that for more of the bigger jobs. And I also use the aerosol haze in a can for quick, you know, atmospheric. You, you need just a quick little scene or a shot and you want some atmosphere in there. It's literally, aer it's literally haze in an aerosol can. But yeah, the one I own is a Hurricane Haze 2D. Simply Og5 asks, just curious, what was your budget for this project? So my budget was... I, I didn't know the overall budget. I had an idea, but that was mainly controlled by the agency. Um, the agency just reached out to me as a vendor and they just paid my day rate for each of the days as well as I did editing for them as well. And so they paid for that. Um, I'm not going to disclose those numbers yet. Maybe I'll do a, another video on how I go about the business side of things. It was just my day rate. Um, it was the editing rates and then that was pretty much it in line items. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm not sure the entire budget for the entire production. Um, that, that's not something that's within my scope to know or 
you know, tell you guys. In part one, Jay Oakley asks, how is a video treatment pulled off? Just take the camera out and get some grabs showing the general vibe. So if you look at part one of this series, I do a video treatment um, and it had a bunch of photos and stills that were kind of giving off the general vibe, but those weren't my photos. Those were stock images that I use. I wouldn't have enough time to go out and shoot unless it was like very specific and I really wanted to get the vision down and be able to share that with people like this is exactly how I want it to be. But again, uh, same as the storyboard. You don't want to go too specific at this point of the production. You want to leave room for open-ended um, creativity and evolution within the concept. So no, I just use stocked footage, um, stock images from Google Images, or there's a free uh, website with free photos that you can use called unsplash.com. So yeah, just stock images, and I kind of compile those together and do a couple different written down um, text just explaining you know what what the vibe is what the creative move is and how we are how i'm trying to establish and, and pull off the shot and that is the end of our four-part series <sighs> it's been a long one thank you guys if you've been with me this entire time watching through all of them thank you so much for joining if you haven't make sure you go back and watch part one, two, and three, and continue commenting and continue giving me your feedback and how I might have done better. But yeah, I'm so glad that you guys were a part of this. I'm so glad that I was able to share all this with you. Again, I hope you get something out of it. To forecast a little bit, I'm working on a couple more videos, a little sneak peek. I'm working on like a lens comparison. I have a set of Leica, Leica R's, and a buddy of mine has a set of Canon FDs. So I'm going to do some, some comparisons, Leicas versus modern, um, Leica versus Canon FD, Canon FD versus modern, all that kind of stuff. I also want to do a breakdown of this new uh, rig I've been using um, with the new DJI RS2, um, switching between handheld and gimbal really, really quick. And so those are some of the things that are coming up soon. Um, I have a few jobs this month, so I'm going to try to get to them as soon as possible. But Love you guys. Thank you. God is real. Keep grinding. Keep supporting each other. And stay healthy and stay blessed. And bye. Peace. Later. See ya. I'm out. Bye.